Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 151 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name is Barbara. What's happening? Oh, nothing much. Just killing it here in Indiana in the lab business yourself. Right on. I tell you what, February's been really busy. A lot of really big smile design cases and just a lot of units coming in the door. It's great to see. Yeah, absolutely. We had a not so great January or not as much as we'd want. But I tell you, February just came rocketed in and it's all fixed. Our removable section's a little down, which is a little weird, but I've learned over the years, it's either fix is busy or removable is busy. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. It's strange, but it's looking real good right now. So has anything fallen off after you got your shot or are you doing all right? So I got my second vaccine shot last Monday. I have a tail, a third eye, lost (laughs) an ear. Wow. And my fingernails turned green. No, it was fine. About the second day, I had some flu-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. Most people probably would have spent the day in bed, but you know, I'm such a great worker that I decided to tough it out. But yeah, that's all I had. And then by the third day, completely fine. Good. Good for you. Yeah. Don't be scared, everybody. It's worth it. And we want to get everyone vaccinated so everybody can go to Vision Visions. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where you were going with that. Yeah. This week, we talked to the person behind Anextent. I think I said it right this time. I listened I to do it believe like you 20 did. times. So Good this job. week, we talked to the person behind Anadex, Anadent, <laughs> Anextent, North America, and their absolutely brilliant marketing, Tay Harvey. Tay came into the dental lab business by way of mini implants, boo, and business consulting. Then she connected with Anextent. Tay felt that their products could succeed in our industry as long as there is a creative way to get the word out. And after many peaks and valleys, Tay and Anextent have found their niche with technicians doing full arch gingival composites using PMMA and pectin and so much material in between. With an amazing passion for unique marketing, Tay and Anextent are sure to catch every eye in our industry. So join us as we chat with Tay Harvey. Hey, Barb. I called Oradent the other day about their P5 milling machine. Super. How did it go? I was introduced to the consumables Oradent offers, such as Delta Zirconia, Oradent ZR, Oradent cutting tools, and Quest PMMA. How convenient. You know what? You can buy the mill and the materials from them. Yeah, if you think that's convenient, you can also buy furnaces by NeighborTherm, and vacuums by Renfert. Plus, I don't have to talk to a different person every time I call. I have a rep dedicated just for me. I have heard that their service is amazing. Absolutely. Oradent offers high-quality cutting tools made here in the USA, and they have great options for zirconia. Delta Zirconia, which is a super cost savings for labs, and Oradent ZR, made proudly here in the U.S. of A. Do they still offer dental alloys? You know, Oradent started off manufacturing alloys and will always provide high-quality alloys for dental labs, one of the few companies in the U.S. to still manufacture their own alloys. Is there anything that they don't supply dental labs? Actually, they also offer dental scanners and a 3D printer from Shining 3D. Hold up. Does that scanner have its own design software? Actually, Oradent offers ExoCAD for your designing needs. Nice. I'm not the best with technology and setting up all of this equipment, just saying. Well, we know, but that's <laughs> fine. Oradent has a technical support team who can help with installing or troubleshooting any problems. Wow, Oradent definitely is a one-stop shop for any dental lab's needs. How do we get in touch with them? You can always call our friends at Oradent at 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit them at their website at Oradent.com. We super appreciate your support of the podcast, Oradent. Thank you so much. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. We are happy to have on the podcast today, Tay Harvey from An Accident. (laughs) 
an accident. An accident. An accident. An accident. <laughs> Yes, an accident. North America. You know, there's a couple ways we find guests for the podcast. It's either Barb and I know them already and beg them to come on. People ask to come on. Or somebody does something really cool on, like, social media (laughs) that I see and I'm like, that's amazing. I want to know more about it. And that's how I found Tay. Tay, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, great. So I saw you on Facebook, and you were doing these ads, and they were like retro 90 ads. Yeah. And it just caught my attention. I grew up in the 90s. Me too. You guys did a fantastic job. So I want to hear about how you got into the industry and your yeah. involvement with the an accident. An, okay. An accident. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yes. Well, I really, I, I want to tell you when I got your Facebook message asking if I wanted to come on, it was like so casual. Like, would you like to come on the show and talk? <laughs> I mean, I'm not too proud to admit I've been like waiting for that message from you for a long time, <laughs> Elvis. Aww. <laughs> I'm too proud to like email you and say, can I come on the show? But I was really (laughs) excited to get your message. (laughs) And then I started listening to more. I've listened to episodes, but I've always listened to episodes of your podcast where it's somebody like I know that's a technician. I'll listen to learn some more about them. I have to admit, other than Jim Glidewell, which that was a Fabulous episode, by the way. Thank you. I hadn't spent a lot of time listening to the other manufacturers. I like to kind of not pay attention to my competition so much so I can Uh kind of keep it original and fresh and not follow the leader. But leading up to this interview, I listened to some of those episodes and I have to say, like, I was more intimidated coming on this Uh morning than I thought I would be (laughs) because... The very name of your podcast is Voices from the Bench. And Mm -hmm. I did a pretty deep dive. And so far, I didn't really find any other manufacturers you guys had on that had not experienced life from the bench. And I am not a technician. I have not experienced life at the bench like they have. Mm -hmm. So I got a little nervous. I was like, oh, geez, like, what do I have that I can share with the audience that will be as valuable as all these great people that you've had on. And it made me start to think about the origin of Annex Dent. And it's Annex Dent North America. So Annex Dent as a brand and a, and a product line had been around before, long before I came on. But I realized that the common thread and what makes me so happy working in this industry is that creativity to me is is sort of everything. Uh And I I think you see that probably in a lot of the things that we do at an extent, we like to be creative. We like to do things differently. We always like to be making things, even though we're not making the products ourselves, we're strictly importing them and supporting our customers who buy them from us. So I realized, okay, the one common thing I have, I couldn't, I've tried to build up a crown. I've tried. (laughs) I've tried to make a denture. I've tried to do all the things that technicians are great at doing. And I can assure you, I'm not great at doing any of it, even though I know the steps. But I think the reason that I love this market so much is that I get to be surrounded by creative people all day, every day. I am a creative person. So the story of Annex Dent really goes back to being a college graduate. I I graduated the year after 9-11. I graduated the May after 9-11, which is an interesting time to enter the workforce. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I studied, oh, it was was a crazy time. So I studied journalism in college uh, with an emphasis in advertising. I love ads. Like, I think I could sing you pretty much any jingle from my childhood from television commercials on command. By Madden. <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved them. Went to college thinking I was going to be a doctor because I also wow. love science and then quickly realized I needed more sleep than doctors get. <laughs> and so my mom actually said, I, I think you're on the wrong track here. I, I think it's great that you love science, but you probably find something where you can get eight hours of sleep a night. Okay. 
So I happened to take an advertising class just because it sounded fun and found my passion and loved every minute of studying advertising and journalism and writing. And I had set my goal to move to New York and work in a big fancy ad agency. And I just knew that I could get it done. There was one path to doing that that was certain. You could win this award from the American Advertising Federation. 15 college students every year got this award. And if you won, they flew you to New York. You got to stand up and speak in front of every single executive team of every ad agency in New York. And you were guaranteed a job. Like you were guaranteed that these people fight over you. And I got the call in August of my senior year that I won. And I was so excited. (laughs) And so I knew it. I was like, looked at my college boyfriend. See you later. I'm moving to New York. (laughs) And I'm going to live my dream. And 9-11 happened a month later and they oh. called all the winners and said, listen, everybody's on hiring freezes, but we don't want you to miss out on this opportunity to experience these interviews and this speech. So you're all coming up, you're all going to do the normal thing, but none of you are getting jobs. You just need uh, to be aware. <laughs> okay. I'm not- So I got to go to New York, experience all that. And then they were right. None of us got jobs. And I ended up moving in with my grandmother back in my little hometown of Ardmore, Oklahoma, not really knowing what to do. And a friend of mine said, you know, there's this company in Ardmore, they make fake teeth and they are growing like crazy. And they said that they need a graphic designer. Mm. Okay. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. (laughs) Now I'm a horrible graphic designer. I'm I'm not good at it. (laughs) But number one, I needed a job. Number two, I had this idea that in this small town, who's going to be better than me? Like, I'm probably the best. Yeah. And yeah. So I went, I interviewed, and I did not get the job. But about two months later, they called me right before I was about to just move to a bigger city and try to find something. They called me and they said, hey, come in and interview. There's this international sales position. I think you, you might be great for it. Mm. Oh, okay, well, I speak one language and I don't know anything <laughs> about international business, but I'll go. Yeah, sure. And about halfway through the interview, and this is for a company called MTech Corporation, who I don't know if you remember, but they made the little mini implants. Oh, yes. Mm. So yes. that was in my hometown. So oh. halfway through the interview, which I don't really, I don't know how well I did. I mean, I was making good conversation, but I didn't have any experience that they were looking for. And the girl interviewing me said, you know what? This is silly. We're wasting time. You've got the job. Apparently your mom went to high school with the vice president's wife. (laughs) And I'm supposed to just give you the job. And so long story short, like I was introduced to dental implants. And though Intech was famous for the mini implants, yeah, they made money back then. This was back in 2003. They were making money selling an external hex like Brandemark clone implant line into emerging markets. So it was a low mm-hmm. cost alternative in emerging markets. And their catalog yeah. was massive. They basically made any abutment that any dentist called and said, hey, I've got this idea for an abutment. They're like, all right, we'll make it. Yeah. And so <laughs> the catalog was massive. And I remember the day I got it. And I looked at it, and this sounds so cheesy, but I'd never seen a dental implant. Yeah, this was your first introduction to it. It was my first introduction. Wow. And immediately I knew, oh my God, like, I love this. This is so cool. So over the course of the next eight years, I went from, uh, they gave me such great opportunities. I mean, I went all over the world, and it was my responsibility to train all of our distributors in different countries. I got to the point where the company had purchased a CT company and everybody was into making the CT scanners Uh and nobody cared about the implants anymore. (laughs) And at the age of like 27, they kind of turned that over to me. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. And so, I mean, if I (laughs) had had an idea for an abutment or a a snap-on coping, you know, it was kind of a new thing back then. And if I felt like we should make one, I just walked back to the engineers and sat down and said, hey, let's make this. Let's let's design this. And we'd 3D print it. And I'd take it to the dentist that ran the, the company, Dr. Bullard, and show it to him. And he'd either say, yeah, let's make it or no. So <laughs> I had this opportunity from pure luck 
that I got to kind of know what it was like to run a business without having to run a business. Nice. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But 3M bought the company. The last two years I worked there, it was owned by 3M, which was also great. But at one day, my 3M manager sat me down and said, hey, I just need to tell you, we're really happy with you and you have a great future at 3M. But I need you to understand that at any moment, you know, the people that have high potential here, we might call you and say, it's time for you to go to traffic signs and wow. traffic <laughs> signs. I was like, what do you mean traffic signs? And I said, but, but I like dental, like I know implants and I seem to like be able to understand this better than most people. And I really love it. I don't ever want to leave dental. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, but if you stay with 3M, you're going to have to leave. Like you're going to have to move around to all these different things. And I thought- You could be making post-it notes or something, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe, <laughs> I mean who knows? Scotch maybe that, tape. <laughs> maybe that would be a blast. I don't know. But <laughs> I just had found my passion and yeah. I didn't like this idea that now all of a sudden everything I'd worked for was something yeah. that would just belong somewhere else. So you said, see ya. (laughs) Well, you know, it was a hard job to say see ya to. They take care of their employees. It was wonderful. But then one day they walked into my, actually they didn't walk into my office. I was home with my firstborn child. She was three weeks old. And they walked in and said, hey, this is going to be a tough day for everybody here. We're going to shut down the factory. We're going to move everything to St. Paul. At this point, this is all still happening in this town of 25,000 people in Southern (laughs) rural Oklahoma. It's kind of a weird place. So I had the chance to move to St. Paul, but I said no. And so in 2010, I found myself with all the confidence in the world and just (laughs) enough experience to probably be dangerous. But Uh. I thought, I know how to do this. I'm going to do this for myself. I'm going to start a consulting business. And I'm going to help people do, you know, launch products. That's That was the idea. Yeah. I was going to help people launch products. That's what I like to do. Dental mm-hmm. products or just any product? Any dental. product. Oh, I was oh. thinking and, dental. Any, wow. I mean, it was just dental, but actually there was a lot of fuss over what I could and couldn't do after leaving a company like that. Mm, um, yeah. Dental. So there were some issues there, but, but I quickly... <laughs> Have either of you ever done any consulting? No, fortunately. Just friends and family. <laughs> Ooh, it's a different ball game. So I bet my first client was in the electric world. And y'all, long story short, I remember driving out of the McDonald's parking lot in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. In my rear view mirror, they were shaking their fists at me. Like consulting, I, it was wild. Like when you're just you, I, I don't know. I quickly learned that consulting wasn't exactly something that was predictable or offered any security at all. Why were they shaking their fists? They didn't like what you consulted them to do? and They asked for a copy of a business plan they were paying me to write. Yeah. And I said, well, well, it's not done, but if you want to have it just to look over, it'd be great to get some feedback, you know? Yeah. So I handed it to them. (laughs) And the next day I got a fax that they canceled my contract. They didn't like the business plan. They weren't going to use it. And so they weren't going to pay me. Wow. Jeez. <laughs> when they, did, they did use the business plan, you know. But anyway, I mean, it, it was just, I stood up for myself and we had a contract. And so I had to like fight to get paid. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it was crazy. Jeez. In the meantime, I had picked up this client in dental, thank God, because of a friend of mine who had been working with a couple of people who wanted to start a product distributorship. And so they had me come down. They were in Dallas, about an hour and a half from me. So I was Uh driving down there a lot, helping them profile different products that they could bring to market in the US. I mean, I had a new baby at home. My plan was to help them come up with a business plan, hire the right people, probably work alongside those people for the first nine to 12 months, and then walk away. It wasn't my long-term job. Yeah. So Chicago Lab Day 2011 was the first time that I like left my little baby. My whole life was travel before becoming a mom. And then I had this little baby and I hadn't had to go anywhere. Oh yeah, I remember. And I remember like 
crying all the way to the Dallas airport, flying to Chicago, coming to lab day, just to kind of look for products, talk to some of my old contacts and a mutual friend of mine and Andreas Kopietz, who's the owner and founder of Anextent GmbH in Germany. He literally just like threw me in front of Andreas in the bar area at the oh, Sheraton. The big bar. Well, no, it was, a, it was back when it was at the Sheraton. One of our favorite places. Oh yeah. I, I, you know, there were some things I miss about that place. I love the space yeah. of the new location, but he threw me in front of Andreas and said, Hey, I just think you guys should meet each other. And I don't know if you've ever met Andreas Kopietz or you know mm-hmm. who he is, but I call him Willy Wonka. He looks a little bit like a Willy Wonka. He's got this crazy curly blonde hair. He's always dressed like impeccably and a little bit odd. <laughs> He's got a lot of style. Like his style kind of enters the room before he does. Nice. Kind, of yeah. kind of like Elvis. Just kidding. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Presley, not doll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But he and I just kind of looked at each other and didn't really know what to say. I wasn't sure why my friend thought we should meet each other. And he was carrying this stack of catalogs of his products, the Annexin products. And he handed me one and I kind of looked at it and added it to my big stack of catalogs. Mm. And I said, oh, thank you. You know, my name's Kay Harvey. Nice to meet you. And then I went to my hotel room and I started looking at all the stack of catalogs. And this Annexin catalog was... Like nothing I'd seen. It looked like contemporary Mm -hmm. art. And the first Mm -hmm. page is beautiful. And the first inside cover, when I open it, there's a double page spread of a huge blown up picture of an acrylic shade tab on like a keychain thing. And sitting on the shade tab is a housefly. It's like a big photo of a housefly on a show guide. I don't know why I liked that so much other than it was weird, but it caught my attention and I looked at that catalog in so much more detail than I looked at any of the others. And I saw things that I didn't understand, like some systems and devices that I'd never seen before. But I knew that I wanted to talk to this guy more. So I emailed him on the email address on his card. And I said, hey, you know, you live in Germany. I live in Oklahoma. We're not going to have many chances to talk face to face. So can we meet for breakfast in the morning? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm. We'll meet for breakfast in the morning. And he no show. Oh, my God. You're kidding me. <laughs> no show. Now, knowing Andreas the way I do, I get it. Like, I should have seen that coming. But he no-showed on me and I was real mad. And I thought, well, that's that. And I went back to Oklahoma and I'm looking through these catalogs. And he called me and he was so apologetic. And I forget why he no-showed. There was a good reason. But anyway, we started talking and we hit it off. And Annex Den at that time was centered around this flasking system that was without stone. You used putty instead of stone. And it was really cool. And I said, okay, I think I'm going to recommend to these guys that they bring your brand over. The brand had no presence in the market. There Uh were a couple products that because of really high profile um, contributors to those products had some visibility. So Christian Coachman had helped Annextent develop Annex Gum Pink Composite. That was sort of over here through some distribution effort by MicroStar. Oh, yeah. Wow. With uh, the Pink Composite by Christian Coachman. And of course, he was on podiums all the time talking about it. So there was interest in it. And then Michelle Monnier actually helped develop the first product Annextent really made, which was New Outline Acrylic. Two amazing people, just saying. Yes, absolutely. And that's certainly one of Andreas Kopietz's strengths yeah. is he connects with awesomeness. You know, those people, yep. those big personalities, because yeah. of his big personality, I think they kind of gravitate toward each other. <laughs> so I knew that there was some brand awareness, but it was minute. Hmm. And there was this product that required people to change the way they were doing things, this whole system. And so I went to the Dallas guys and I said, okay. Here's what I think you should do. I think you should stop thinking about building a supply house business. And I think you should bring this brand over, but it's going to mean a lot of education. Like you can't bring this brand over and a bunch of other stuff because it's going to take time. When you talk about the brand, are you talking about the the Annextent itself? So they were based in Germany. Yep. Stuttgart, Germany. Microstar was 
was selling like kits of Annex gum, but not really refills. They were just kind of supporting the orders that would come in when Christian mm-hmm. Coachman spoke or when Michelle Monnier or Pascal Monnier spoke about these products. There was a way to get them. So they were FDA cleared. They were kind of available here, but there hadn't ever really been dedicated marketing or support or sales or anything like that. So for the next year, I did things like go over to Annex in Stuttgart and get trained by their technicians, understand the product better, come up with business plans, go and meet Michelle Manier, which was mm-hmm. amazing, and learn from yeah. him and start to wrap my head around what this industry looked like. Because at Imtech, it was strictly clinical. I was really on the clinical side, but it really wasn't an accident (laughs) that I ended up gravitating toward the lab side. Right at the end of my time at at Imtech, I started working with more technicians because of a certain kind of product that we had added to the line. And I knew 100% like those were my people. I was just going to (laughs) say... And then you fell in love. Oh, I did. I did. And I knew because the market and research that I had in front of me at a company like 3M, I knew one thing. I knew that the dental lab market was about one-tenth the size of the clinical market, right? One-tenth the size. Wow, that's interesting. One-tenth the size. And I don't know if that's different now from a dollar value. From a dollar value, it's about one-tenth. Size. And so I certainly didn't pursue a career on the lab side because I was looking to make millions of dollars. I just knew that these are the kind of people that I could be myself around. And Mm -hmm. I think as a young person building your career, you don't have a lot of moments where you feel like you can bring yourself to a project and like, that's a good thing. I think you you spend a lot of time looking around you and trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing. (laughs) (laughs) That's well, yeah. Still doing that. Well, yes. And and we always should. We always should be doing that in in one way. But I felt like that was kind of all I was doing. And sometimes I would see myself in those people I would observe and I'd feel good about that and say, oh, maybe I've got some stuff to offer here. But when I was with technicians, it just felt right. Like they were so creative. They were so open. They were themselves. It was almost like they didn't know how to be anything other than that. And that gave me the permission to be myself. And I was surprised at how much that meant to me, Mm -hmm. how much I felt like, oh, this is a sign that this is the right place for me. Yeah. We're just the best. It's a, it's a, you are. are. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I realized I wanted to be on the lab side. So long story short, these guys I was working with in Dallas who really never ended up in the distribution business, but were great. I mean, they were very receptive to my plans. We were working great as a team. Then I don't know if I've told this story really in a public way. So this is probably new information to anybody even that knows me pretty well. Yay. Yeah. (laughs) On December 23rd of 2011, I got a call from the guys in Dallas and they said, listen, our family has encountered this legal situation and all of our assets are frozen Mm. and this is going to be a long-term kind of like battle that we're fighting. We're not doing the annex thing. Damn. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Like the one that we're launching in Chicago in two months. Oh, no. And the one that we have a booth in Chicago and the phone number that I was just finishing setting up our phone systems to. Because right now those phone calls that are in ads that are in all the journals that I can't pull. Oh, God. Are going to ring my cell phone because I hadn't bought our system yet. Jeez. And they said, yeah. I'm sorry, but we can't do anything about it. And they said, oh, and we don't really want to call Andreas. Would you please do it? Oh, man. Oh, nice. Tag your it. <laughs> so nice. I called Andreas and I told him and he said, oh, okay. I said, listen, do you have the money to do this by yourself? Like, could you do this? Could Could we start the business here and you finance it? He said, nope. I said, okay. I mean, he's a very small company. I said, okay. And he goes, here's the deal. I don't know what to say to you right now. I'm really sorry. You know, I know you've been working on this for a year. He said, I'm about to get on a plane and go to Thailand and I'm going to be off the grid for like two weeks. So when I come back, let's talk some more. Maybe I'll come up with an idea or something. Okay. Two days later, I got a call from the guy who actually introduced us, Eli Gannon. And Mm -hmm. he said, Tay, I don't think you should just let this die. I think you really believe in it. And I think you should try to find a way, try really hard to make it work. Mm -hmm. We've got Chicago coming up. Why not give it a try? I said, okay, let me think about it. 
And I remembered Peter Peasy had called me about mm -hmm. three weeks before. And he said, hey, I've heard about this Annex Dent flask system. I think it sounds amazing. If you will find somebody who can teach us how to use it, I will have my friends come to my lab and they will pay to learn <laughs> and it'll offset your costs. And at that time, y'all, I don't know what I was thinking. I didn't even know anybody who knew how to use it. Like what? <laughs> who would launch a, a product line that they themselves don't know how to use? And they don't even know anybody in America who knows how to use it. So in hindsight, it just seems like a pipe dream. But, but you said yes. <laughs> I know, right? I know. Mean, so, but here's the crazy thing that came back in my mind. And then I remembered, hey, wait a second. I had gone to the DLOAC meeting in California uh -huh. and I had met this little guy. I shouldn't say little guy. I'm really tall. So to me, there are a lot of people that I would call little guy. I hear you. I had met this guy. And I think the reason I call him a little guy, his name's Yarrow Urbanski. He's little in stature. But I've never seen somebody, the whole reason I he even caught my eye, he walks in the room like he's 10 feet tall. Mm. So I see this guy just walking around the DLOAC. And I was there just kind of still trying to learn about the industry. And he walked by Andreas when we had been there together. And they stopped and started talking. They knew each other from before. Uh -huh. And I didn't understand what they were saying to each other. Yaro speaks a lot of languages. Andreas speaks a few. I don't remember which one they were speaking, but it wasn't <laughs> English. Yeah. And I just saw what they were showing each other on their laptops. And it was full arch implant cases that had been done with the flask. Uh, mm -hmm. Good memory. Yes. And so I asked Andreas, hey, you remember this conversation? Who was that guy? He told me. And, and I, I didn't even really introduce myself to Yaro there at the DLOAC because I didn't even know if he honestly could speak English. <laughs> and I never heard him doing it, so I wasn't sure. But anyway, he gave me his phone number and I called Yaro. And Yaro honestly couldn't speak English very well at the time. Uh -huh. And I said, I, I think I saw that you know how to do full arch implant cases like hybrid dentures with this system. Am I right? He said, yes. Wow. I said, can you teach other people how to do that too? And he said, I've been waiting my whole career for somebody to call and ask you nice. that question. Wow. <laughs> so y'all, let's just be clear. I don't know if this guy knows what he's talking about. Like, how, who am I to know? <laughs> so I called Peter Peasy, and this is probably just purely out of desperation. It was a year of work. It was a lot of work to get this all set up. And I called Peter and I said, I got somebody. Can you make that happen? Can like we do it in like two weeks? And he said, sure. And then at the end of the call, he said, Tay, are you positive that this guy has something to teach us? And I said, oh, no. yeah. I said, yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but I didn't know. I just, I felt in my soul that this was the right thing to do. So I had received some products just already at different times. I put everything I'd gotten in a suitcase. I used my personal Amex to fly Yarrow from Mexico City, where he was living, uh. to New York. We get to wow. Staten Island for the course, and Yarrow and I go to dinner the night before. And he looked at me and kind of laughed. And he said, you don't know, do you? You don't know that nobody in this country knows how to use this stuff. I said, oh, that can't be true. Like, this <laughs> <laughs> to be some people that know how to use this stuff and he just laughed and he said no but you know something tells me that you're going to change it by the way i've not talked to andreas i did not get it was okay on any of this because he's in thailand uh, yeah oh yeah that's right he returned back from thailand the morning of the second day of that course at that course i met josh polanski peter rich pavlov there were a number of kind of industry veterans and giants there and sure. i was like all of them just be blown away by this. And I knew, okay, it is something. Like we can yeah. do this. This is something worth doing. <laughs> and so Andreas called me. I remember when I was standing there by Peter's little coffee, espresso machine that second morning of the course. And I said, hey, you don't have any money. I don't really have any money, but we got to make this work. Like there's something here. And so we did. As business people you guys know when you start a business and you don't have any money like yeah. uh, that is not an easy road <laughs> no no <laughs> it is not an easy road so what we ended up finding 
things were going really well right off the start. It was great. We had a great time, great show in Chicago that first year, 2012. And then CAD CAM, which was already kind of taking over, uh-huh. that's really the year that was the tipping point. So after about six months of great sales, fantastic courses, I mean, the courses were a nightmare to put on, but they were going fantastic. About six months into the business, it was like everything changed overnight. I had probably 60% of my sales were this powder liquid acrylic system that you inject in a flask. And overnight, all my biggest customers of that new outline product bought mills. <laughs> and I had discs, but they weren't great. It's certainly not something Annex didn't have put a lot of time into developing like they had with the other materials. So overnight business just dried up. Mm. And I mean, I was just throwing everything I could think of at it. And the first probably three years, I felt like I was on a train that I just would just do anything to jump off of. It was it was awful. And I will just be honest about that. Like it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I believed in it so much, but I kept trying to figure out like, okay, is this a market? Just not want this? Like, <laughs> is there a place for it? Is there something I can do differently? Because the customers we had that used our stuff just absolutely loved it. But I just couldn't seem to figure out how we could fit in a, like a majority of labs or even like all the labs that were focused on kind of an artisan approach or is this artisan approach just dead? Like, what do we do? And I think I focused so much on figuring out how to fit. Like everybody around me seemed to be fitting so well and I didn't that I didn't really put a lot of effort into accentuating what made us different and (laughs) what made us special. So I think all of that changed one day, it was Chicago 2015 was kind of looming over us. So it was probably like October or November of uh-huh. 2014. And I had three employees at the time, me, Jen, and Rachel, who's still with me today. And we all met and I said, listen, I think we could scrape up about $1,500 to market what we're doing at Lab Day. That's about all I can scrape up right now. And the problem is our competitors are spending hundreds of thousands. So what can we do? Is there a possibility that with $1,500, we can do something that people have seen or heard about or talked about? Like, is there something we can do that's going to get noticed for $1,500? That's not a lot of money. Just saying. No, (laughs) no, it's not. I mean, an ad, just even like a half page ads, 5,000, right? Yeah. So what are we going to do? And at that time, our customer email database was minuscule. So there's not mm. even much organic I can do. I can do some Facebook stuff, but that wasn't really working for us either. So all of a sudden, and I owe this to my mom. <laughs> good old mom. Good old mom. So y'all, my mom, she was different. So she, <laughs> <laughs> she had a real difference. She was, an, she was an English teacher for like high school juniors. And she wrote raps and performed raps every Friday during football season. Um. This was so cool. When I was 10, I thought it was really cool. So she would come in and say, guys, tell me a song that's like a popular rap song right now. And we'd tell her and she'd listen to it. And then she would go to her room and come back and say, okay, turn it on. And she would, she had rewritten it to be like about the team they were playing and how they were going to just kill this team they were playing on Friday at the football game. And she did that for years. And when I was in high school, I was humiliated by it, but now, now I see just like how genius it was. Yeah. Anyway, we're sitting there and I don't know why that came to my mind, but I said, guys, we're going to do a rap video. And they just laughed at me. And they said, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's the worst idea we've ever heard. I said, okay, <laughs> just give me, give me five minutes. And then I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to show y'all why it's not stupid. So I went to my computer and I quickly wrote it. I did inherit that from her. Like in my 20s, I would write a rap every day. I had this like alter ego that I'd write raps on MySpace every uh, day. MySpace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the character had a page and I would just post my raps all the time and they'd be about whatever happened that day or whatever. It was a fun like thing I would do. So I'm pretty fast at it. And within about five minutes, I had rewritten the lyrics of It Takes Two and I went into the main office. I said, okay, turn this on. And I rapped it to them. And they said, oh, 
yeah, we, sh- we should do this. I said, okay. <laughs> so I found a video guy that does the AV for his church here in town. And he'd shot a couple commercials that were really good. And I just thought he was pretty talented. So yeah. I asked him, how would you feel about doing a rap video about dentures? And he was like, <laughs> sure, let's do it. So we did it. And I didn't even tell Andreas I was doing it. And he's very, very protective of his brand. So I was a little worried. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm going to put this out there and people are either going to love it or they're going to think it's stupid, but it didn't cost that much money. And I think it might get people's attention. And it definitely did. Like, yeah, I think I saw immediately the value of bringing what was unique about me and us to what we're doing (laughs) because this industry, regardless of what kind of lab it is, at the root of it all is creativity. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. I think creative people have to be surrounded by other creative people to feel comfortable or just like they can be themselves. I think being yourself as a creative person is, is just like an innate need. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that moment, we just kind of opened ourselves up and it all went up from there. So when you put it out, where did you put it out? Like, did you have it at Lab Day or did you have it on YouTube? How- yes. So we had it on YouTube and I also uploaded it to Facebook. Now, I think the timing was right because Facebook today, man, I put something on there and five people might see it. Like, they, yeah. they don't, it's not the same as it used to be, Mm-mm. but... I think we had, I don't remember how many views that one got. It got a lot of views, but we put it on Facebook. People shared it. People loved it. Nobody would ever really done anything like that before. And we played it at our booth at Lab Day. And the poor guys, at, I think it was Medentica that was next to us that year. <laughs> <laughs> they were so over it. Yeah. But it was really well received. And I quickly realized that that meant I had to do another one. And uh, it took me about two years to do another one but it was the second one that we did that really like went over the top with it like i think it got thirty thousand views on facebook wow in the first few days so that second one i think i had proof of concept like i used a real safe song that everybody would recognize on the first one i made it all about chicago the second one was about us and like our product. And I picked yeah. a song that I love that not a lot of people aren't actually probably ever heard it before. So we were a little bit riskier with the second one and that paid off too. And I think that really is what made me see like in this industry, nobody does what we're doing anymore. There's a reason they're not a lot of companies like Annex Dent North America. Truth be told, like we probably should have shut down. Mm -hmm. multiple times in those first five years I'd say and we just kept going and then finally at the end of that road we realized oh okay we're different and let's just play that strength up let's just be different and people love it (laughs) so that's where we are now so like the you talked in the beginning about the 90s vibe yeah shoot we put up there so another thing we do every year is we try to send out a New Year's card. It wasn't supposed to be a New Year's card the first year, but it just took a long time to make. And so it ended up being a New Year's card. As <laughs> <laughs> and we try to do something funny every year. And it's really hard to come up with new ideas. And we just, this year, that was our theme was just 90s awesomeness and lasers. Yeah, the lasers and the <laughs> uh, pastel jumpsuits. I loved it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, let me tell you, those were supposed to be like sweet retro track suits. Yeah. Do you know how hard it is to buy five track suits that are the same? Like, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I it's don't know, it. honestly. I've never it's tried. In, it's impossible. And then I thought I'd found the perfect ones, and I got these really sweet, like, Adidas track suits in the beginning. Yeah. I was so excited when I put mine on, and I was, like, running around the office. Look how cool these are. Rachel came around the corner in hers and she looked at me and she goes, you know what I look like right now? I look like a barbecue that has one of those black covers all on it. Ah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not going to make anybody feel like that in the tracksuit. But yeah, those Nike jackets were sweet and everybody made fun of them and then we got them and everybody loved them. Yeah. When did you guys start doing the art on the boxes? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, that got a lot of that sharing did. during the pandemic and the shutdown and all that. When did that all start? I'm always going to be honest. Like, that was not my idea, really. It wasn't in this industry. I think we're the first people that really did that in the industry. But yeah, there used to be this website called neighborhoodies.com. Interesting. Okay. This is way before, like, you can get a custom shirt that says anything now. But yeah. Back in, like, maybe 2002, 2003... This company called Neighborhoodies popped up. I'm sure I saw an ad on like MySpace or something. Yeah. You're dating yourself again. I know. That's okay. That's all right. I, I wear it proudly. But Neighborhoodies had taken like the hoodie that has your neighborhood on it. Like if you're from Brooklyn, you get a Brooklyn hoodie, right? Mm, if you're mm-hmm, from Queens, mm-hmm. you get a Queens hoodie. But Neighborhoodies lets you put any neighborhood on there. Like I could put Ardmore or whatever. So you sent the name of your town. It started that way. And then they ended up like having complete customization. So if you wanted to make a t-shirt that said anything, a sweatshirt that said anything, you could. I loved that website. And I noticed this little page that on their About Us, they had pictures of a My Little Pony on a box. Somebody had drawn a My Little Pony on a box. And they said that one day in the comment section on the order, some customer had said, draw my little pony on my box. Hmm. And they did. (laughs) And they did. And they kept doing that. And I thought that was so cool. Hmm. And so I thought, you know, I want to draw on boxes. And hey, when we started, we had all the time in the world to draw on boxes. Because there weren't a whole lot of boxes going out the door in the beginning. And so we really have done that probably since two years in. And the people, the very first ones I did was just mess it. I wouldn't even draw a picture. I just like wrote something funny on it. Yeah. And they shared it and they loved it. And so I said, guys, let's let's try to do this all the time. And at multiple times, it would kind of ebb and flow how good we were at doing it. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was me in the beginning doing it. It's easy for me to come up with like little things to say. I know our customers as individuals really well, so I can like write inside jokes on it or whatever. But it wasn't something that we made a part of 100% of the boxes until the pandemic. Yeah. It was a good hard reset. We had the time again, but I realized this is something that logically I always knew that, that if we did it, it really wasn't a good idea to not do it all the time. Yeah, because if somebody saw that and said, oh, that's cool. I want that. And then you get a box with nothing on it. That leaves you feeling pretty disappointed. Yeah. So it's something I'd always knew that we wanted to make a more consistent part of what we did. But we started going through these growth phases where I didn't think it was realistic. Now we've just structured our time differently and structured our workflow in the warehouse differently where there's not a box that goes out that doesn't have something on it. Now, if it's a crazy day, it might just be some quick little thank you message. Yeah. But whenever possible, we try to really put some extra effort into it. I mean, people send us messages that say, I was having this horrible day and I got this box and it totally made my day. So you guys custom do every box? Every box. Wow. Box. And I saw a ton on Facebook with people sharing their pictures. <laughs> I wanted to order something just so I could get a box. I know. And, and we've had people <laughs> say that before. So we've had to come up with ideas. And Katie Skinner is the only person picking, packing, and shipping orders for us. We have one person doing it. Mm-hmm. She's really good. She's so like, accurate and precise. And so we don't like to mess with her workflow. There might be a day or two where we go back there and help, but not really. Mm -hmm. She's just so good at it. We just let her do her thing. Yeah. And we're doing same day shipping. Like if somebody orders an express package, like we live in a small town, we don't have a lot. We don't have like late drop off times or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We can't like go to FedEx at six at five o'clock. That's if it's not on that truck, it's not getting out. But with express packages, we can still drive it just a few blocks over, drop it off at at by five o'clock. It goes out. So if somebody orders at four, we promise that we're going to get it out that day. So even with that kind of time constraint, Katie makes it happen. Wow. With art on the box. (laughs) With art on the box. Like we've had to come up with ideas and she's good with this too. As a team, we kind of say, okay, what about stencils? So we get her stencils and that helps her. What about like spray paint? So we've started doing spray paint, which is so like, ugh, it's so stinky when we do the spray paint. But 
but you know, we found ways to just be creative about it and make it realistic to keep doing. And it's something that now I see I'll never let up on again. I think that's always going to be a part of what we do. Yeah, I think so. Seems to have taken off. Yeah. What is your best selling product now? Like, what are you guys known for now? Well, we started becoming more known by bringing a product on back in 2015 that was brand new to the market, Pecton. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay, I know that. We brought on Pecton. And I won't claim that we've like changed the market forever or anything like that, but we really were the first company that made a strong effort to bring high performance polymers to the market. A lot of people know us because that was a product that everybody was talking about for a long time. And it's still a product that we carry and it's one of our core products, but pink composite annex gum is by far our most popular product. Which is funny because in the beginning, Christian Coachman would tell me all the time, Tay, Annex gum has such potential. I was like, really? Because like a doctor orders a kid and that's it. Like it's so much composite. There's no way they're going to, they're putting it in these little black triangle situations. Yeah. They're using like these minute amounts of it. He said, no, 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 no. Annex gum going to be this big thing for you. And I think at that time we were stocking 10 reorder syringes of each color at the time. Wow. That was funny. That was plenty. <laughs> like we sold a lot of kits, but we didn't have that many people who were buying multiple syringes. Then when everybody started milling these full arch prototypes and PMMA, they started putting Annex gum on those. It started to grow, but we're not the cheapest. We're definitely not the cheapest pink composite. So people weren't really looking for the prettiest pink composite to put on a provisional. Oh, I get that. Yeah. But... As digital dentures have come to the surface now and Crystal Ultra has come and mm -hmm. people have learned how to bond pink composite to zirconia, for example, the market has moved in a direction where thankfully this product that we know really well and that is by far, I mean, I'm biased, but it's the most beautiful and it's the easiest to work with on the market. So we've got this great product that now all of a sudden has this new relevance in the market. Awesome. And that has been amazing. That's why we are where we are today. Is so originally that was a chair side restoration. Yes. And now it's become more of a laboratory use. Yep. For, interesting. I didn't realize it started chair side. So now instead of 10 of each color, there's some colors we have like 800 on the show. Oh, wow. At a time. Wow. So to say that it's grown is just an understatement. It went from virtually irrelevant to this product that is used every day in a lot of labs. Pink Composite was around way before Annex Gum. Annex Gum was only created because Christian Coachman was using a different product and was really frustrated that he was going to that manufacturer and saying, these things about this product are really hindering my work. I really wish you could make these colors a little different in this specific way. I wish you could change the translucency. I wish it didn't slump like it does. Like it was pink composite. Like who cared at that point? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't blame them for not acting on his inputs, but he went to Andreas Kopietz and Andreas said, hey, okay, let's make it. Let's make it the way it should be. And that's what they did. Wow. And fortunately, we had invested a lot of effort in understanding pink composite, understanding bonding. We developed a lot of relationships with technicians who are open to sharing their techniques for application and surface sealing uh -huh. and things like that. So once the market needed it, we were ready. And yeah. we've really, really enjoyed watching that product grow and helping people be successful with that. And we work a lot with Digital Dental, who makes Crystal Ultra. Sure. We work hand in hand with them. And that's been an incredible partnership. So when you get a Crystal Ultra, it's got the Annex gum on it? It depends. I think the way that Digital Dental works with the labs is that can be how it works. Like if the lab yeah. doesn't have the ability or the desire to do that part in-house yeah i see yeah digital dental can finish it for them but i think a lot of people are also milling it themselves and doing everything sure that's been a lot of fun and then we brought on implant parts which is really, oh, really? near and dear to my heart and i've had a lot of fun with my staff wants to like throw them out the window right now because there's <laughs> just you have to have so much knowledge like yeah of all the different platforms and the history like i 
when I was involved with implants, it was kind of the golden age from that 2003 to 2010. So many companies emerged and so oh, many yeah. platforms were introduced. And I know that Alpha Bio is, you know, became Noble Active and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It really helps. But I love the implant parts, and that's been a big source of growth for us, too, I think. You're not playing with minis, are you? <laughs> no, no. And I feel so like there's a part of my heart that I feel like I really have turned my back on with minis because, you know, for a long time I I'd worked with minis. But, yeah, no, we do not Good. Uh, Good. work with minis at all. Labs don't like minis. Exactly. I know. Agree. I know. Agree. I, I get it. I get it. But yeah, no, we're just working with all the major platforms yeah. really. and multi-unit abutment components have been kind of our big focus. We've got a lot of customers lean well, on Well, that us. goes hand in hand with your pectin and your exactly. composite. I mean, it's a one-stop shop. I mean, for all Yeah. Of and my goal has always been to, my goal still is to become the company where when you get a full arch implant restoration, you think, I need to call you an extent. Nice. But that's hard to do. In a market like we're in, sure. when so many huge companies are innovating all the time and introducing new options into the market. But we just try to always understand what's out there, learn as much as we can about all the products that are part of that workflow. So we spend a lot of time on the phone with customers talking about products that we have nothing to do with, just because we understand the workflow and where that fits. So I've been really lucky to grow my team with people who are like-minded and want to just always be a good resource. So we have a good team and pretty much anybody who answers the phone is going to be able to help them. And if not, they just send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and if I don't know, I've got so many friends in the industry I'm really grateful to have that help me. And sure. that's what it is. That's what Annex Den is today. It's a great story. It's unbelievable someone with a marketing degree. <laughs> hey, dude, I didn't even have a marketing degree. I tried that and I was oh, so bored in those classes. A journalism degree. I have a journalism degree, right? Yeah, but, that's boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Here's what I think. My whole life, I've put creative people on a pedestal. To me, you can be good at math. You can be good at politics. You can be good at public speaking, whatever. There's so many things that we can admire in each other. But when somebody walks in and they can write music or they can draw or paint or sculpt or do something creative, I think that is so valuable. Like to me, that is just the top of yeah. the value a person can have. And I believe that people who are creative, it's like oxygen to be around other people who are creative. And I'm sure working in labs, you guys understand like business ownership too. There are times when I don't get to exercise those creative muscles. Yeah. And I feel increasingly depressed yeah. <laughs> as those times go on. Well, it's the same thing with technicians, you know, they can sit down yeah. and, you know, do the work and they just have to do it. Yes. But they get excited when they get to do the one they have to be more creative about. Even Absolutely. though it might even be harder, take more of their time, they get mm -hmm. excited about it. And if you don't get that very often, it's easy to get burnout in a lab. Yes. So and so I, I believe that an extent at the core, we are about exercising our creative muscles. So whether it's bringing over Pecton and now telling people, hey, I know full contrast zirconia is amazing, but what if you design a full arch of individual crowns and a frame that they fit on precisely and you have to make all the crowns and you cement them all in this frame and then you put the pink composite on like god how much more complicated can we make it but mm. you talk to somebody who's made one of those restorations it's like mm. they're on top of the world it's yeah. an amazing feeling to make something like that so okay i'm gonna sell one pecton disc for every god i don't know how many hundred zirconia discs i could sell we don't sell yeah. zirconium, so I don't know. But I get to have this conversation with somebody that is feeling like they have just reached their creative peak on what they made. Okay, we sell pink composite and it's expensive. Maybe our pink composite is, is more expensive. But for the person who values the aesthetics and the contours and the texture that they can create with it, I know that I was a part of that. Yeah. You're speaking to my soul. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I'm not foolish to think 
that we are going to be a market leading size company. That that's not ever been the goal. But at the end of every single day, I've had at least three or four conversations with people who are feeling fulfilled with the work that they've put out that day. Let's also not forget the patient, yes! you know, that ends up with this wonderful beautifully yes. made not just a factory made but an artistically made restoration it makes a difference it makes a huge difference and the more time goes by the more and more people we, we've just grown very slowly we've grown our customer base very slowly this is like we just celebrated nine years i guess pretty much this month so it'll be our 10th wow. anniversary next year and everybody told me in the beginning it's going to take you four years to turn a profit. In year one, I laughed at them and I was like, they don't know me. Watch this. Yeah. And then year five, I was like, y'all said it was going to be four years. <laughs> 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 y'all said this would be faster than this. So we've not grown or performed better than expected or better than the average company at all. We haven't always done things right, but whatever we've done has finally led us to a point where we know we're right where we need to be. And it seems to be that it positively impacts all of our customers on a daily basis. And that makes me happy. Definitely. Sometimes that slower growth is more substantial growth that's going to stick around longer. Yeah, that's right. Rather than I'm everybody doing. jumping on board for the hype of it and they don't stick around. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and I think in the beginning it was hype. And that's why we struggled so much. We had these big names that were talking about us and they still do. They still believe in us. They did then and they still do. But it was a lot of hype yeah. and we had to grow up and create our own noise. And once we were able to do that, it's it's been really fun. I, I can't I, nice. I can't leave this industry now. Like, thank God I didn't go to traffic signals. <laughs> I would have missed out on all of this. And it's become just my life's work that sounds corny but man i love it well we're happy that you're in it i'll tell you yeah. that. <laughs> i love what you're doing i think it's great i love the ads i love the connection you're making it's cool thank you i think it's needed and it stands out it caught my attention so yeah. it works well and you know I, I think it does serve as a reminder to technicians who are all Regardless if they're running the business side of it, you know, they've left the bench and they're running the business. They're creative souls. They're never going to grow out of that. I hope that we serve as a little validation and reminder of the fact that that got any technician where they are today is having that creative spirit. Awesome. Aww. Well said. Well, Tay, we appreciate you coming on the podcast to tell your story. I really thought, honestly, <laughs> when we started, we were going to be spending all this time talking about product a and product b and product oh, c no. but this ended up being so much better because yeah. we got to hear the story of it and the passion that you have and it's yeah, inspiring i appreciate it i know i listen to some of the people talk about their products i am passionate about our products but i don't know i mean i just think that it's so much more valuable to your listeners they're not going to start product companies you know or maybe yeah. they are really? use products that they're going to stay with and that's fine but i think it does help to understand that you got to put your whole self into it don't hide like be who you are and even people who think that those jackets are ugly as, as can be they still liked it you know like yeah. it's just us being us uh -huh. people like that be as crazy as you are absolutely i love it thank you so much tay thank you thank you guys we appreciate it. we'll talk to you soon bye bye Few things create more interest today than the digital denture. Whitmix has developed a processing system for printed dentures, which uses Dentka, the first 3D printed denture and denture teeth resins to ever receive the FDA clearance. Their physical properties and biocompatibility pass FDA requirements and enable the printed denture properties to be very similar to conventional dentures. The material, coupled with fast and easy 3D printing with Asiga printers and the convenience of curing with a UVtron UV light, results in fewer dentist visits, predictable fit, reprintable data files, lower cost, and excellent intraoral denture performance. The Denka material available from Whitmix includes an ivory color trying material 
tooth shaded materials in Vita shades A1, A2, A3, A3.5, B1, and B2, and denture based materials in original pink, light pink, reddish pink, and dark pink shades. To learn how to create your own digital denture, check out Whitmix.com for their digital denture courses and for more information about the system. Thanks for your continued support of the podcast, Whitmix. So we cannot thank Tay Harvey enough for coming on the podcast to tell us about her unique and entertaining story and how she brought Annexdent to North America. It must be some great products because a lot of big names and past podcast guests have posted pictures online using their products. I know Alexander, Alexander, once, how do you say that? Wunche. Why do I have to say all those names? <laughs> I know that Alexander Wunche and Arian Deutsch, Mark Williamson, and of course, the amazing Peter Peasy. So go check them out at AnnexDentUSA.com and head over to their social media pages to see what the great rap videos, which are amazing, that they have put together over the years. Great stuff, super entertaining. It's great marketing. Awesome. Well, that's all we got for you guys. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good week. Bye. See ya. Bells. I mean, I can't, a little no, bell just bells. bells. Happy bells.